Good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to the Mingella Building and the Department of Film, Theatre and Television. My name's John Gibbs, uh, and I'm Head of Department, and I'm going to do a, a little double-headed introduction to this evening with my colleague Lucia Najib, who's the Director of the Centre of Film Aesthetics and Cultures. It's a particular pleasure to introduce this evening's speaker, Laura Mulvey, theorist, filmmaker, and professor of film at Birkbeck. On her first visit to the Mingella building, but on a return to the department of which she was a member between 1979 and 1982, in her first post in higher education. In those days, before the merger, which brought Bulmersh College together with the University of Reading, we had a different name, film and drama, and a different location at Bulmersh. But I hope Laura will feel strong continuities as well as appreciate changes. The teaching of theatre and film together, the integration of practice with critical, theoretical and historical approaches, the underpinning emphasis of close reading and performance analysis <coughs> to everything that we do. Few scholars in any subject have so consistently produced illuminating and transformative interventions in the field. <coughs> Visual Pleasure and Narrative Cinema and her work on Douglas Sirk and Melodrama in the 70s are landmarks in the development of film studies. The 90s saw, among other things, the publication of a monograph on Citizen Kane and Fetishism and Curiosity. In 2006, Laura published Death 24 Times a Second, a foundational text for the study of the digital in film. And then the edited collection the following year, British Experimental Television. As well as directing and co-directing films across this period, including 23rd of August 2008, which was selected for last year's Berlin Film Festival, Laura also had a key role in inspiring videographic criticism. With one of the first video essays, although that term wasn't, in, wasn't current at the time, presented on the occasion of another of Laura's returns to Reading as keynote speaker in the Style and Meaning Conference in March 2000. Throughout, her work is characterised by the evocative and suggestive turn of phrase, the ability to move between a delicate grasp of material detail of films and wider theoretical ideas, the skills of a critic and the ability to overturn received ideas. It's a compelling combination. But before we get to hear Laura in action, I'm now going to hand over to Lucia, who's going to do the second part of the introduction. Hi everybody, Lucia Najib is my name. Uh, I'm known to most of you here. Uh, just a few announcements. Um, this lecture is going to be followed by um, a wine reception. You are all cordially invited to join us afterwards uh, in the celebration of this wonderful event. Um, uh, this lecture will also be followed by Q&A um, and everything is being filmed so please use the Romy mic when you ask your questions at the end. Um, a few acknowledgements obviously to my dear colleague John Gibbs, uh, we've been working together very closely uh, in the organisation of these events um, uh, which are uh, organised by CFAT but al always counts with the, the unstinting support of the Department of Film, Theatre and Television. But I, I would like uh, also in particular to thank Becky Hillman for her help in organising this, Ellen Deering, uh, who, Ellie Deering who is behind the camera here, uh, Chris Bacon, our fantastic technician, and the students uh, Jack Lovegrove, Lovegrove uh, Rachel McMillan, and Josh Beavis, who are helping us uh, with uh, different parts of the um, technicalities here. Now, just a few words about CFAC, um, an acronym that stands for the Center for Film Aesthetics and Cultures. Um, a centre which is rapidly fulfilling its ambition to be a centre of international excellence in research and teaching of film. 
CFAC um, is a catalyst for expertise, expertise in film at the University of Reading, with members from different departments, schools, and faculties across the university. Um, uh, Laura Mulvey today is our third uh, public speaker, um, and um, these three public lectures um, were organized um, uh, by CFAC, uh, but this time in particular uh, in partnership with the Department of uh, Film, Theatre and Television, given the, the particular significance of our guest speaker to the origins and history of the department. Uh, CFAC is very keen to meet the aims established by the new research and international strategies being in implemented at Reading. Uh, our membership is growing with international PhD students and postdoctoral fellows, one of them, Dr. Igo Kristic, I think he's here, um, who is in charge of CFAC's next big event, the conference World Cinema and the Essay Film, uh, starting end of April and including several international keynote speakers and filmmakers. Another big event will be the workshop Disappearing War on 13th of April, jointly organized by Lisa Peirce and Christina Helmish um, with a fabulous lineup of speakers as well. Um, and so on and so forth. So um, stay in touch with us. Um, our website is uh, www.writing.ac.uk slash CFAC. And write to me or to Igo if you want to, put, uh, to be put down on our um, mailing list. Now, a few words uh, about our guest who uh, doesn't need any introductions, but she's going to receive yet a second introduction now. <laughs> Uh, not just because she's the greatest film scholar in the world, but <laughs> because we all love Laura Mulvey. We have all learned how gaze construction operates in the cinema thanks to her revolutionary feminist essay, Visual Pleasure and Narrative Cinema. John has already mentioned that, but also her afterthoughts on visual pleasure and narrative cinema. We all continued to worship Laura when she drew from Freud, psychoanalysis, and Marx in order to explain to us the workings of fetishism and curiosity in the cinema in her book of the same name. And now we cannot stop quoting the pensive spectator and delayed cinemas developed in death 24 times a second, her pioneering study of the effects of new technologies on the ways we experience film. But we love Laura Mulvey for sh sharing these jewels, as well as her extraordinary filmmaking, with us, with unparalleled generosity. Laura's attitude towards film theory has never been to impose, but to share, to create opportunities for new scholars. Laura is the best because she's the most open-minded person I've ever known. Traveling the world with her inseparable, inseparable notebook, and today she has at least four <laughs> notebooks in her handbag, um, uh, where she takes notes of every phrase, every thought she hears at the endless conferences and events she attends, and often also organizes. And she then incorporates the, those little thoughts and ideas in her monumental edifice in honor of cinema, making them sound like the work of innumerable geniuses. Whether we come from close or from as far as Brazil as I did, she will keep an open door for us. She will support us because this is her politics. Laura Mulvey's feminism means democracy and solidarity. And she will never relent on this point. We all have a collective debt to Laura, and we cannot thank her enough. Oh. Max of Youth has been one of Laura's long-standing passions, and today she reserves some new revelations about him. We can't wait to hear that. Thank you so much, Laura. Well, it's very difficult to follow on from that. <laughs> uh, though, what I would like to say to begin uh, my presentation this evening 
is that uh, John was quite right. It all started for me, not actually physically here, but down the road at Bournemouth College, where um, I got my first uh, regular job in higher education uh, in the wonderful uh, film and theatre department, uh, it, which was an extremely uh, exciting moment uh, for me. Um, and I learnt so much from the way that uh, Bournemouth organised its teaching. The principle of co-teaching, so that I worked alongside Doug Pye um, with such vivid memories of the classroom uh, there at, uh, at Bournemouth. And the way that uh, Doug organised things was often not only by pairing uh, lecturers, but also pairing directors. So we would do a Hollywood director alongside a European director, say Hitchcock alongside Renoir, um, Cirque perhaps alongside Visconti. Somewhere along the line there, I did Offals, and I have certain memories of working on Offals's, one of Offals's Hollywood films, Court, uh, in the Bullmarsh days. But um, the other thing I just wanted to evoke from uh, those days in Bullmarsh was precisely, as John mentioned, the importance of textual analysis. And this involved a certain amount, on my part, of terror at the equipment. There was a very large 35mm edit editing table, which John just reminded me was called the Prevost which stood at the back of the seminar room. And uh, to make it work for our most extraordinary experience of actually doing textual analysis frame by frame with 35 millimeter prints, in order to have that extraordinary treat, one had to take the film off its wheels and put it onto cores. Nowadays, none of you would know what a core is, but it's a tiny little plastic thing on the top of which is a large 35mm film. The danger of the core dropping out and the whole film turning up on the floor and the terror of this very, very large and frightening machine was actually compensated for by the enormous pleasure of doing literal uh, frame by frame uh, uh, analysis. Um, I actually was invited, Doug invited me to come to Bournemouth in 1979 because Victor Perkins, who founded the department, had just left for Warwick. So I came in as a stand in for Victor, which was in itself a rather amazing experience. And <coughs> Victor is possibly the, one of the people in the world who loves, I would acknowledge this, that he loves offals more than I do. And rumour has it, or perhaps he even told me this when I last saw him, he's actually learning German so that he can read. Is this, do you corroborate this? Yes. That, yeah, that he's yeah. learning German so as to read Offels' autobiography uh, in the original. Otherwise, it doesn't exist. There are little bits of it here and there in Cahiers du Cinema and so on. But you corroborate that Offels is Victor's. So, uh, great love. So, here I think I would kind of rather like to dedicate this lecture to the moment when I replaced Victor at Bournemouth, uh, but also to his uh, great passion uh, for, uh, for Max Offals. Um, now, I, my paper today, um, it, I'm a little bit anxious about it. As you can see, I'm still kind of looking through my pages because I tried to put something together that was a little bit different from anything else I've done on offals, um, rather for this special occasion. <coughs> and um, so my paper, my presentation is in three parts. The first part, which I consider to be rather both unconventional and conventional in a way, is about Offals' own life and his own experiences with the cinema. In some ways, it's unconventional 
because the whole concept of thinking about biography uh, alongside the text, as it were, um, disappeared out of uh, film studies and criticism uh, very much at around the time when I went in, uh, in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in the 70s, went to think about the actual the actual aspects of a, of a director's life was, in a sense, to undermine his place as a, a great auteur. So, in some ways, there's something old-fashioned and conventional about bringing back the director's life story, but I also like to think of it, in Offels's case, as something that's absolutely essential for understanding his, film, uh, his films, and I'll come back to that. Uh, in a moment. Um, now he's also he had a very uh, a, um, a very uh, up and down uh, career, as I am going to evoke in a moment. But also he has um, an interestingly twisted and turned uh, uh, place in the history of film theory and criticism itself. And you might say that as film theory and criticism have changed over the years, you also see the place of Max Offals moving almost like a kind of um, signifier a kind of uh, what the kind of t changing trends were. So originally uh, in the 1950s, uh, he was taken up by the directors, by the critics, of the Cahiers du Cinéma, who later became the directors of the Nouvelle Vague, uh, and seen as one of the great stylists of cinema and one of the great auteur directors. Now, and he, they of course championed him in his very difficult later years, which I'll come back to later on. But then, uh, in the, by the time we get to the 70s, uh, with the rise of feminist film theory, um, feminists claimed Max Offals for themselves as a director of the woman's film and as a master of uh, melodrama. So these were the stories of romance, feminized narratives that were bound up with sexuality or the family, those films that privileged a female central character and very much addressed to a female audience. And I think around the 70s um, and 80s, perhaps into the 90s, you could say that work on um, writing, critical writing on Max Offals just ex exploded, didn't it, John? You know, with Victor and a lot of feminist writing. And a lot of it concentrated on Letter from an Unknown Woman, which isn't a film that I'm going to be talking about this evening. Um, and, and so he's a very much uh, uh, written about, very much discussed uh, uh, director, but very particularly ado adopted by uh, feminist theory and feminist criticism. Um, now, my approach here is both generic and autorism, and again, I realise that autorism is also slightly unfashionable, but I feel that working with a director like Offals, it's almost impossible to avoid it. But I feel that Offals' relationship with melodrama is ambivalent. Um, during his period in Hollywood, he never really settled into the studio system. His uh, films were always somewhat aberrant, and he rarely, perhaps only with court, uh, fitted, uh, allowed the happy end to take over the film, as did, for instance, his fellow German exile, Douglas Sirk, who always emphasized the fact that the happy end was the mark of the melodrama, as well as the stamp of the producer and the front office, who felt that the uh, happy end was an essentially American trope. Um, but I want to make three um, initial points uh, about the relevance of melodrama 
to Max Offal's, uh, and particularly in terms of La Signora di Tutti, which is going to be the main focus of my remarks this evening. Now, first of all, we all understand that the melodrama focuses on family, and La Signora di Tutti certainly belongs to the melodrama genre from this point of view. Um, the melodrama is marked by its characteristic dramatis personae. It has a set of characters who come out of the nuclear family, father, mother, children, and out of this setting, uh, the, the, uh, both the, out of this setting, the traumas and tensions around family relationships begin to congeal and cohere into a dramatic situation. So whether it's tensions between child and parent, between siblings, uh, between mother and son, and so on, the melodrama makes clear the way that the family, the actual kind of hearth site of love between uh, family members is also the site of emotional tension and potential trauma. So these two things uh, exacerbate one or another and develop into the kind of uh, the, the melodramatic uh, genre. Um, and I think it, one of the things I think is interesting about La Signora di Tutti is that Gabi's family, for those, and I think most of you saw it this afternoon, uh, that G Gabi's family is doubled. She has her first biological family and then her adopted family, which I'll come back to. But the firm family is certainly there. And the tensions throughout, develop throughout the film uh, between the, the relationship between the two sisters, the relationship between father and son, uh, and Gabi moving from one family into another. Next, there's the question of gender. And... As I pointed out earlier, uh, we tend to think of the melodrama in terms of uh, a central female character and um, uh, uh, the women's film. I have tended, in fact, my recent interest in Offals has really been out of um, his, to my mind, unparalleled uh, reflections on questions of masculinity rather than femininity. And so the extended work that I've done uh, on him recently has been around three films, Liebelei made in 1932 in Germany, Letter from an Unknown Woman made in 1947 in Hollywood, and Madame Du made in France in 1952, in which in all three films he creates contrasting iconographies of, uh, of different kinds of masculinity, which is not my topic here, and I'm going to control myself and not go into it. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but I do think that that question of uh, gender and masculinity is very important in a letter from, non no, sorry, Freudian slip, La mm -hmm. Signora di Tutti, um, because here we see the doubling of the fathers and when I get on to show you the clips, that's the point at which I'm going to start. Um, but there's also the aesthetics of the melodrama. As any of you who have seen this film of Offal's or his others will know how much he was a master of the mobile camera, whether it was through tracks, crane movements, um, his camera in a sense, almost has no sense of gravity. Uh, and it, can, it has a choreography which moves with a choreography of the characters. So in some sense, to use rather a cliched metaphor, there's a kind of a ballet of character and a ballet of camera, which we'll also look at in one of the opening sequences. Um, of the movie, but also, uh, and I think we become very aware of this in um, in in La Signora di Tutti, that uh, melodrama is also uh, a melos alongside drama. It's to do with sound and music 
and the emotion of sound and music. And that's very key to the kind of central, pivotal point of Alma's death, which we'll uh, uh, look at in a moment. Um, and going back to my early days at uh, Bulmersh, where I learned, and we learned, how important the uh, questions of mise-en-scene are in the cinema, and the way that lighting, camera movement, and so on, is key to articulating any question of narrativity, character, or character interaction, but also how important the house is in the melodrama, the depiction of domestic space, the different topographies uh, for the house. So those were the three opening points um, uh, about the melodrama. But La Signora di Tutti is a hybrid film. On the one hand, we could say it was a melodrama, but on the other hand, its framing story is set in the film industry. And so this hybridity enables a reflection, uh, a, a, a melodramatic story fused with a reflection on questions of the cinema, or perhaps more precisely, uh, the female star as commodity within the film industry and the relationship between her beauty and the mechanics of cinema and how the two kind of uh, work together, which to my mind is one of the extraordinarily po interesting points uh, about this film. So in the third part of my paper, I'll come back to that. And also alongside it, I'll introduce Offals's last film, uh, Lola Montez, uh, in which the same kinds of questions of the female <laughs> star and her commodification are, 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 are key. Now, first I want to say something about his Europe, uh, Offals's Europeanness. Um, so, I contend that Offals in his work and in his cultural outlook transcended national boundaries and was from the beginning and always remained a European. Now this is slightly controversial because it was point, it's been pointed out to me that however much I hold close to my heart this sense of internationalism associated with uh, Offals, how important German culture and German uh, traditions of German cinema were to him uh, uh, as well. But I still contend that this sense of Europe is there uh, in his uh, work. Um, and it's due to his birth, due to his pan-European uh, career in cinema, and also his struggle in Hollywood to preserve his own very European uh, style. But also I think that the legacy of European modernism and internationalism that marked his generation in the 1920s continued to be a source of reference for him. So I now just want to uh, expand these points a little bit. Um, Offels was born Max Oppenheimer in 1902 and the first point of my uh, sense of him as European was that he was born in the Saar, uh, which is a small province of Germany which borders on France and sometimes belonged to France and moved backwards and forwards. So, in a sense, is almost essentially, Igor is nodding, yeah, uh, uh, essentially kind of mixed French and, uh, and uh, German. Um, he was determined not to go into bis follow his father into business and to work in the theatre, and he apparently changed his name to Offals so as to avoid causing embarrassment to his deeply respectable uh, parents. Um, so I think there's something about his Jewishness and the, uh, the ge geography of his birth that contributed to his ability to cross frontiers. <coughs> but like so many others at the time, he left the provinces Saar seemed to be very provincial, uh, and was for the internationalist, intellectual, modernist milieu of Weimar Germany. Now, uh, many years later, 
he worked with Georges Anankoff, who was his costume designer on the 1950s films in France, uh, who became his very close friend and his confidant. And Anankoff published a short account of working with uh, Offrels, which begins with the story of how Offrels insisted on a kind of cultural cultural and artistic negotiation between them before he could imagine that they could work together. And um, they both began, they began with the Russian theatre where Alan Koff had worked with Meyerhold and Offerall's it uh, cites um, Alexander Tyroff's book, The Theatre Unchanged, that had been translated into German and had influenced him when he worked in the German theatre. So one of them would offer Meyerhold, the other would then offer Tyroff. Um, and then they would move through a long discussion mentioning key names so that they would understand each other's influences and where they came from. So for instance, Max Reinhardt, Wedekind, Schnitzler, favourites of European literature, and then ending up with the greats of silent cinema. And then Offels exclaimed, c'est parfait, notre langue commun est trouvée. It's perfect. We have found our common language. So there's that sense of kind of coming together around the kind of international uh, uh, modernism of the uh, teens and the 20s, which was still important to uh, Offels uh, towards the end of his career in the 1950s. And also, just to return to his geographical origins, although the Saar might have seemed very provincial to him at the time, the first uh, a critic to write about Max Offels, Claude Berli, emphasizes the importance of his geographical origins and says, C'est un homme du Rhin. It was, he was a man of the Rhine, with all the historical, cultural implications that the geography of the Rhine carries with it. Um, now, Offels only really became interested in the cinema after it began to speak. Uh, before that, he'd worked in the uh, German theatre, going from city theatre to city theatre in a very similar way to, uh, that Douglas Sirk did, ending up in Berlin with a successful enough career in the uh, theatre to be able to move almost seamlessly into the huge uh, production studios of uh, Ufa. In 1932, he made Liebelei, uh, which was a great success, and it should have been the beginning of a, uh, um, a really important career in German cinema. But in the aftermath of the Reichstag fire, he realized, and he was told by his friends, that it was impossible for someone of a Jewish origin to stay in Germany any longer. So he, with his wife and his little son, Marcel, uh, just packed up and without anything that they couldn't take with them on the train, left Berlin and moved to Paris. Um, eventually he became a, a, a French national, but he worked until, 19, uh, till the fall of France in 1941 in France, in Holland, and then with this one wonderful exception in Italy with La Signora di Tutti in 1934. But when, uh, uh, after the German invasion and occupation of France, Offels had to move again. Um, he'd made broadcasts for the French army, propaganda broadcasts into, German, into Germany in German, denouncing Hitler, which had been very popular and made quite a big, um, uh, attracted quite a lot of attention. And so once again, he had to pack up and leave doing the famous journey with his wife and son across the Pyrenees through Spain into Lisbon and getting on the road out of Lisbon and arriving in New York. Now, a lot of stories about this, which I can't actually um, go into now because I want to talk about the film. But I just wanted to say, as a point of interest, that his son, Marcel, recounts his father's <coughs> commitment to a united Europe how much he loved the idea of Europe, and also how he refused to blame Germany for Hitler. 
and how he used to argue with the <coughs> other exiles in, when he was in Hollywood. Marcel says, my father and his friend Fred Kortner were always getting into fights with other Hollywood Jews. Both believed that Goethe and Schiller shouldn't be held responsible for Hitler. Um, by this time, there were too many European exiles looking for too few jobs in uh, Hollywood. And he didn't manage to do that for four years. And when he did, he had a hard time. Um, he insisted, as far as possible, on uh, shooting with his famous fluid style, uh, with complicated setups and his beautiful crane movements. And these were not only kind of resisted on a practical term by many of the um, production team in Hollywood, but very particularly the editor that he worked with, Ted Kent. Um, who felt that this way of working was Germanic and un-American. This wasn't the way in which American, the American people uh, understood cinema. And I just wanted to have a quick, uh, a quick uh, quotation um, uh, from assistant director Ben Chapman. Max went into some of these tremendous gyration shots that are very typically German. He liked to get on a crane and wander all around the place. He liked to do a hundred foot dolly shots and dolly track shots and walking, uh, waving his hands in the air, and that sort of thing. That's just gilding the lily. That's how pictures became so expensive. When you have a director like Max and he has a German attitude and a German way of shooting things well, uh, that's when you get hurt. A good commercial director doesn't do that. Um, but Um, I think it's important to remember this because in some ways La Signora di Tutti is almost the kind of crucible out of which that amazing style uh, um, emerged. Um, I just wanted to talk about uh, his uh, end of his life. Um, he returned to France and made four films uh, in the early 50s and then he died in 1957 after he made Lola Montez, which some people consider to be his masterpiece. And once again, he was directing, back in Germany, for the theatre, a production of Beaumarchais, The Marriage of Figaro in Hamburg. Um, and I'm going to come back uh, to Lola, so it's important just to put it in place here. As his first colour and widescreen film, he really struggled with Lola Montez. He wanted it to be his masterpiece. And his colleagues at the time felt that he, Offals, intuited that this would be his last film. And Jacques Natanson, his uh, screenwriter, said, this gives this description of how Offals was wounded by the film's disastrous critical and box office failure. He said, obviously Max was hoping to create a masterpiece. He was inspired, possessed. Should I have told him? Should I have held him back? Was I wrong? Doubtless I was, because of the brutality of stupid critics. Um, the general public was scared away. Offals was mortally wounded by this blow. With a sad smile, he said, I'll get my revenge in 20 years in the cine clubs. And then, retrieving his ability to laugh, he added, unfortunately, I'll be dead by then. Unlike the critics, he could see the future. But fate didn't give him five years to see his prophecies fulfilled. It only gave him two. So there's a sense uh, in which uh, it's uh, thought that um, Lola Montez, in some sense, kind of hastened his death at the age of 55. Uh, which uh, and there's an extraordinary kind of tragedy uh, to that um, uh, to that premature ending. But uh, to think that he had to remake his life first, starting in Ufa, totally remaking from scratch in Hollywood, and then starting again in uh, in Paris, and ending with his masterpiece dismissed by critics and audience as, uh, it, to such an extent, Victor said, I think Victor said, 
someone has said that when it, it lasted for about a week in the cinema and the management tried to steer the audience out by a side entrance from in the cinema so that those waiting to come in wouldn't hear the uh, dismissive comments. Anyway, it was a disaster and it, it contributes to his death. Now, um, I want to talk about uh, the um, um, the melodrama in uh, in La Signora di Tutti. Um, as I said at the beginning, uh, Gabi, who's our central female character, whose story the film uh, tells, has uh, a bi a, her own biological family. Uh, she and her sister Anna, their mother has died, and they live with their rather tyrannical uh, father, Il Colonello, who represents the army, the patriarchy, and the kind of strictness of the bourgeois uh, family. Um, and I, and uh, as those of you who've seen it, I'll just say for those of you who don't, the film starts with a scandal when Gabi has, uh, has uh, uh, one of the teachers at her school has fallen in love with her and she's expelled. And this is the scene with her uh, father, her aunt, who's the housekeeper, and her sister, Anna. And I want you to see two things here. Once the, one, the characterization of the father, which is the main point. Two, the way that Offal shoots the scene so that the um, so that the drama that's going on, the confrontation with the father, uh, before he calls Gabi in, is only heard on the soundtrack, and we see Gabi wandering slowly and sadly up and down the corridor. Can we just see the first one, Josh? So I think it's very clear there that a particular iconography of the father is being established. Um, and uh, I don't need to go into it because I think the, the, um, the extract makes it very clear. Uh, and the emphasis on the army, on the colonel, the daughter of an army officer and so on, puts the father very much on one side of a particular kind of patriarchal masculinity. Now, I just want to go straight on uh, and see, because I want to kind of see these two iconographies uh, together. So, if uh, Gabi um, is invited to the house of the Nanni family, who are rich bourgeois, uh, and she's kind of adopted by the um, invalid uh, Alma, who's the mother of Gabi's admirer, Roberto, who's actually gone away to Rome to study. So during this whole period, we've had uh, um, a beautiful kind of adopted mother, adopted daughter relationship between Alma and uh, Gabi. Um, and then this happens. Um, and so as I see it, we have the, um, the contrasting iconography of the adoptive father, who is the exact opposite of the colonel. He is the easy, seductive, erotic father, who obviously is going to fall in love with Gabi and him uh, and her uh, with, with him. So uh, uh, to a certain extent, we have a displaced Oedipal relationship here. Uh, as the um, as the daughter father relationship uh, becomes an eroticized one out of the complete um, out of the severity of the iconography of the first father. So I just wanted to get that kind of dialogue between uh, the two of them there, and to think about the way in which this uh, this. A uh, lack of, and as Gabi constantly says, I don't have a mother. And so out of this home in which there was no love, she f comes into the nanny household and, uh, and moves from her close relationship 
uh, with her adopted mother into this love affair with what I think of as her adopted father. So there's a kind, of, as I said earlier, just to reiterate, there's this kind of Oedipal uh, tension at this point. Um, and I just want to carry uh, straight on. Um, but first of all, I want to think about the way in which the staircase becomes such a key uh, f uh, figure. Um, it's a, to a topographical figure. Uh, the staircase in um, our poetics of space, as it were, is uh, an, an, an in-between, a threshold. It's neither one thing nor the other. It's neither the upstairs, the private space of the bedrooms, nor is it completely the public space of the downstairs entertaining area. So in that sense, you could say it's... it's um, uncertain, in between, and signals a kind of danger. And it's interesting the way that Gabi, as she goes up the stairs, if you notice, she slips and stumbles a tiny bit and in her beautiful long dress, and Leonardo kind of catches her and picks her up. Um, but the way he shoots the staircase is also extremely beautiful. And he's not the only director. There are many directors who've made the most of the place of the staircase as a site of strange encounters, but also as a site of kind of cinematic <coughs> potential. And then, of course, uh, in the crucial scene of Alma's death, the staircase returns. And I'm going to show you that now. Um, and uh, this time, it's important to remember uh, the actual place of the melos within drama. Um, and how the music of the radio, which was specially composed uh, for, the, for the film, um, actually articulates the emotion of the scene. Um, so you'll all have noticed, I'm sure, that where Alma lands and where she dies is the precise point on the stairs where Leonardo and Gabi had actually first met. Um, and this comes back uh, in the th a third time. Um, which points, really draws our attention to the way that Offals uses mise-en-scene, but also, as so many of his, uh, of his critics and commentators have pointed out, how he also works with repetition. And in this sense, uh, the <coughs> repetition of the site then immediately uh, says something to the spectator. Um, when something is repeated, it accumulates the meanings that it's, uh, it had earlier, and in this sense, kind of poignantly displaces and changes them. And, this, and here, in the final staircase sequence, we see these resonances and connotations coming together. Um, so I just wanted you to notice there the way that Offros uses repetition and uses the particular point on the staircase to bring out the kind of poignancy of uh, the three moments uh, uh, there. Um, now, I must move on, because uh, I want to move on to my uh, third part of, uh, of my paper. Um, and this is the question of the film industry. Uh, and uh, the way that it's depicted in La Signora di Tutti. Uh, it, the <coughs> film is adapted from a novel, uh, which I've never actually been able to find, and which was acquired by Alberto Rizzoli, who was a newspaper magazine kind of tycoon of the time, who wanted to move into pictures and had greatly admired Liebelei, which he'd seen, and he went out of his way to invite Offerals to come and shoot the film in Italy. And just as many people have pointed out, there's a, a sense it's worth noticing that it was very easy for Offerals to go and work in fascist Italy uh, as a Jewish director, which would have not been possible uh, in, uh, in <coughs> Germany. But what I'm interested in here is uh, the way that Offerals deals directly with the film industry, and particularly with the fabrication and the marketing of this beautiful young woman, uh, Gabi Diorio. Um, 
uh, who is played by Isa Miranda, who was discovered, in fact, for this film. She'd actually played, uh, had a part in another film which had not been a success. And so it was really La Signora di Tutti that put Isa Miranda on the map. Uh, and the film, when it was finished, was shown uh, successfully and won some prize at, uh, at the Venice Film Festival. Um, now, um, From my point of view, this is a really uh, extraordinary demonstration of how uh, the figure of the woman and the beautiful female star is used as a, um, as a commodity in which the cinema invests uh, and to turn her into spectacle. And, the, uh, and how she then circulates as a commodity and as a point of attraction that sells the movie to its public. But I think the opening sequence of the film uh, in which the record Io sono la signora di tutti is being played on the gramophone while her agent and the producer argue over her terms uh, establishes this as, as the, one of the topics that interested Offals, as it were, alongside the melodrama, and to my mind, perhaps, even more than the question of the melodrama. So this is the next sequence, but I just want to say a couple of things before we go uh, on to that. I mean, one of the things I think is so uh, remarkable about that opening scene is the economy, the way that Gabi is signified by her voice and the record and the way in which uh, the negotiation between the agent and the producer uh, literally reduces her to um, an object of, uh, of bargaining. Um, but it also reminds us of the way in which the figure of the star, the figure of the beautiful woman who's going to be projected onto the screen, is also in some sense a mask which is concealing this, the squalid background negotiations on which the cinema actually depends and uh, on which it actually, out of which it emerges and on which it depends. And there's a way in which offers, and throughout the film, we won't see the scenes with the, with where all the um, team of the backroom produ production uh, are collected together, in which Offal seems to have kind of brought a, 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 a whole set of caricatures of the most unsavory and unappealing male figures together, who are going to be then, as it were, concealed and masked by the figure of the beautiful woman, who will actually, as they e emphasize all the time, who they'll be marketing and who will actually uh, make the films uh, mediate between them and the public. So there's a sense right there at the very beginning of what a commodity is, almost in Marxist terms, that behind the beauty of the commodity, which is desired by the public, lies this rather squalid process of commerce and labour and um, uh, and um, everything that, in a sense, has to be concealed, disavowed, uh, for the commodity to emerge uh, into the desiring uh, public. So, in that sense, the woman is the pivot between the desire and the commodity, which is underlined by the film's title, Io sono la signora di tutti, um, and by the negotiations between the two uh, between the two men, and then once again, the way in which she Gabi, the single individual person represented metonymically by the record and her song, is then reproduced over and over and over <coughs> again in the process of mechanical reproduction as the posters uh, emerge from the printing machine. Um, and here, again, we, is emphasized the star's relation 
to mechanical reproduction and to circulation. And Marianne Doan, uh, the feminist theorist writing about uh, La Signora di Tutti, has pointed out the woman becomes the exemplary work of art in the age of mechanical reproduction. And this mechanical repetition of her name on the posters then leads on to the repetition of her name over and over again in the studio sequence, which I'll show you now. And I'm showing you the studio sequence partly because of this kind of emphasis on the star and her name, but also it's one of the... Um, it's one of the sequences where you see Ophrels' camera really exploding uh, into movement and picking up the movement, as I said earlier, the kind of choreography of the people and the extras and the choreography of the camera. And Ophrels himself, talking about this film, gives a lot of credit to the cameraman who's called Udobaldo Arato for having the courage, he said, to kind of take the camera and make it do these extraordinary things. So, having just had the scene of ne negotiation and squalor, in some sense, to my mind, the next sequence shows something of what the camera can actually do, and its beauty and its uh, magic. Um, I wanted you to see the way that uh, uh, Offrels moves the camera just through the walls without uh, caring for any kind of verisimilitude in order to keep that wonderful sweep forwards and then kind of sweep back. But also I just wanted to point out the way from the very first moment with the gramophone, he's also interested in the gadgets of the modern and modernity. And the telephone recurs as an image throughout the film uh, and as we see there, and we saw the scenes with the radio, uh, and Offrels kind of makes that kind of communication uh, uh, environment very, very clear, and it's there, as it were, uh, locating the cinema as one other medium of modern communications among the others. But then, uh, the uh, scene of the star who's near to death then takes me forward uh, to Lola Montez, uh, where once again the film uh, revolves around the figure of a star who's near to death. In the case of Lola Montez, as you might know, uh, she had, was a celebrity, as we'd say nowadays. She might have been the first celebrity of the modern world just famous for her romances and her affairs, the kind of person who would be highlighted by the popular press uh, today, and we could think of, of uh, um, examples. But in Lola, in the film, uh, she's, her sexual value has in a sense been exhausted. She's now old, and her, the ringmaster has decided to exploit her commercial value as a celebrity, and he uses her as an attraction to bring the audience into his, uh, into his, uh, into the circus tent. Um, so I want to uh, show you the opening where we first see Lola uh, appear in the tent, and then I want to show you the last scene of Lola Montez, and then I think I'll make some final uh, remarks, and it'll be time to wind, wind down. Um, so, uh, I, just to introduce the sequence, um, I told you already that uh, Lola Montez was the first film that Offrels made in widescreen and colour, um, which were conditions uh, on the part of the key production company uh, when they made the film. So that came, as it were, without question. And also without question was uh, the, the figure of Martin Carole, who was a top movie star in France at the time, in the 50s, but was famous mainly for her cleavage rather than for her acting abilities. Um, now, I want to say a word about performance here. 
Uh, both Martin Carroll and Isa Miranda have been criticised for their very wooden performances, uh, for the fact that <sighs> wooden performances, let's just put it like, uh, 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 like that. Um, but I think there's something, uh, a, a way in which Offrels uses these, perform these qualities and this kind of immobile appearance in both movies to say something about the woman as commodity and the woman as object of uh, exchange. And I think when we see uh, Martin Carroll first carried into the uh, tent in a moment in, uh, in Lola, um, you will see the way that Offals has used her immobility of both expression and body to create what I think of as a rhetorical figure uh, that represents uh, something of which life, out of which life is being drained. Um, now, when she's carried on, the image of the woman dressed in gold on being carried on this kind of um, thing. Um, um, she reminds me rather of life-sized uh, plaster or wooden statues of the Virgin, which might be carried through the streets of southern Europe on a, a, a feast day. And so just notice the way in which she's dressed her immobility, and then how Offal's cuts to this rather extraordinary close-up. And then we'll go straight on uh, to the end of the film. And th at the end of the film, you have to understand that throughout, the ringmaster has been promising the men in the audience that for one dollar, they'll be able to kiss the hand of this notorious woman. So although uh, La Signora di Tutti ends with Gabi dying, uh, they can't resuscitate her after her suicide. Uh, Lola Montez uh, ends with, the, with Lola, in a sense, near death and with this death-defying plunge. But in actual fact, it ends with this dramatic enactment of commodification, as though the film was asserting this actual abstract theme at the end as the men in the audience come forward to pay one dollar to kiss her hand as she's displayed like an animal in the wooden cage. And which seemingly shows the endless stream of undifferentiated male spectators, uh, the mass audience for which this eroticized entertainment will never stop. Um, and I feel there's an, some kind of balance between, or, or, or symmetry, between the opening scene of, of La Signora di Tutti, made all those many, many years earlier in Italy in 1934, with the agent and the producer bargaining over, uh, over Gabi's record, and this scene at the end made in France in 1955, coming back to the whole question of the commodification of the woman in, uh, in a spectacle. Um, so both Lola Montez and La Signora di Tutti deal with these relations between the entertainment industry and the financial structures on which it depends, uh, which is personified in Lola by the figure of the ringmaster and in La Signora di Tutti by the uh, agent of the producer and so on. Um, now, uh, there's a, a, a moment, uh, there's a, a point in Deleuze, uh, I think it's the movement image actually, I can't remember which volume it is exactly, um, where he talks about films that are made about films, which suggest, uh, and suggests that their representation of money brings time to the fore, because in the cinema, time is money. He says, 
What the film within the film expresses is this infernal circuit between the image and money, this inflation which time puts into the exchange. The film is movement, but the film within the film is money, is time. The crystal image thus receives the principle which is, is its foundation, endlessly relaunching exchange which is dissymmetrical, unequal and without equivalence, giving image for money, giving time for images, converting time, the transparent side, and money, the opaque side, and spinning like a top. And the film will be finished when there's no money left. And so I've been arguing that in La Signor di Tutti and then again in Lola Montez, Offels dramatizes this question of image for money around the figure of the woman and posits the figure of the woman as the essential circuit with through which money moves and then becomes film. So although Deleuze doesn't mention the figure of the woman, something that he's not particularly interested in in any of his volumes, it seems very clear that her body and her, her body attracts the money, and then her image then uh, circulates it. So this actuality of the body exchanged into money materializes in the virtual image on the screen, or the circus ring, which is there as a kind of proto-cinematic um, entertainment. But in this version of Time is Money, the flaw and the a lack of equivalence, the ultimate collapse of the circuit is expressed through the woman's ultimate resistance, which actually ends up with her death. So in a sense, it's almost as though the only way she can break the circuit is uh, through uh, death. And I think <laughs> this becomes very clear uh, in both the films. Um, and finally, when the ringmaster uh, forces Lola to take the huge dive. It's his ultimate gamble. He has to deliver the spectacle of the risk of death, but at the same point, at some point, <coughs> sooner or later, Lola, who they say very explicitly, her heart is worn out, will be no longer there, and there'll be no more money left. Um, I just want to end by saying something, coming back to the question of the performance and the image of the woman, and the way in which both these actresses have been criticised for their immobile uh, performances and their, what people say, inability to act. But it seems to me that this, uh, that this immobility itself evokes the figure of the automaton as a kind of a figuration for the cinema itself. So if we take the image of the woman through, uh, who, through whose body and through whose image the money will circulate, uh, there's also a relationship, a displaced relationship to her as a kind of the beautiful mechanical automaton that acts for a figure of the film machine itself. Um, and it seems to me that Offals, at the beginning of his career with La Signora di Tutti, and at the very end with Lola Montez, um, you reflects on the mechanisms of the cinema that he loved so much and also on the subordination of its stars to the very mechanisms of the industry and the market that produced them and ultimately, perhaps, uh, produce his own cinematic compulsion to uh, repeat. So while Lola's mask-like features conceal the ravages of her illness, and I said earlier that Gabi's mask-like beauty conceals the actual squalor of the um, production system that lies behind her. The suggestion of a lifelike machine condenses with that of human mortality. And here, both Lola and Gabi perhaps sum up the uncanny nature of the cinema. This, the still frames of the celluloid strip 
are mechanically animated into an illusion of life. So its ghostly human inhabitants seem to keep alive, endlessly repeating the gestures of life long after the death of the originals. That's all. Thank you, Professor Mulvey. Um, it falls to me on the behalf of this public <coughs> audience, colleagues, friends, to thank you for what has been not only a riveting lecture, but one which has been exquisitely articulated, beautifully constructed. And I'm sure there will be lots of questions in the audience. But there are so many strands you've shown us, um, not least the one of these repetitions which occur not only within the poet poetic space of mm. the films, but also the, across the whole life of Offals, which yes. you've revealed to us with yes. such... Um, startling clarity. So I invite you to come back and <laughs> I invite the audience please to enjoy this possibility of asking questions now to our public speaker. Um, I think we have 15, around 15 minutes for questions, not very long. So please raise your hands. John. Uh, one of your uh, lovely insights there, Laura, was into the different types of men in the film. The aggressive military male figure and the more sensitive, uh, softer male figure. Uh, and immediately one can think of some of those other characters in the other films you mentioned you've been writing about, say, Madame De, yes. um, and Less for Unknown Woman, yes. Lee Blighty. Exactly the same. Exactly the same. Um, except I think what what's, I think is perhaps particularly interesting in this case is that uh, they're father figures, whereas in Libelai and in Letter and in Madame De, uh, the opposing iconographies are between lover and husband. So there again, there's the, the figure of the patriarchy who's uh, caricatured by his relationship with the military. And um, it's probably not fair to talk about this because other people have seen the films. But if you think of De Sica's performance next to Charles Boyer's performance and how stance and p position um, you know, everything uh, um, brings out that opposite characterization. So I was interested in the fact that in La Signore di Tutti, he displaces these, this iconography onto the two father figures, which makes it, in a sense, almost more... It makes it Oedipal in a way that it isn't quite so in the other films. But I also think that that contrast is there in Ustinov, in The Ringmaster, who is at one of the same time is the uh, cruel ringmaster, but he's also, but he's also um, completely infatuated with Lola, and at the end says, you know if you died I couldn't live without you. Um, so uh, he's, he's, he's both characters in, in, in one. The difference there is that in Letter on the Moon and Madame de, there's, well, there's a gap, isn't there, between the actor and the character of Leonardo in this film and the rather more charming uh, embodiments of that figure it, uh, played by De Sica and Louis Jordan. And I was wondering if it, because it seems to be a slightly bumbling, slightly less successful vision of that kind of masculinity. Mm. Mm. And, of course, he also has the son coming along who, in some ways, might be a more compelling figure. I'm perhaps not the best judge of these things. But is there an interesting kind of gap between the embodiment of the role and the kind of role in the sensitive male figure in, in this movie? Um, I should have mentioned Roberto because the, uh, after um, Alma's death, there's the very poignant scene when Roberto says to his father, you know I've always wanted to marry Gabi and this is the moment when I'm going to ask her and um, Leonardo just says no, no, no. And, and, and that's it. And then, of course, Roberto comes back at the end. But I've seen that more in terms of kind of Roberto, Leonardo. I see more in terms of the conventions of the melodrama genre, uh, of uh, the way in which 
family relations, uh, uh, um, these family relations actually uh, entwined, as it were, throughout the film, and that it and for, turns out at the very end that Roberto has married Gabi's sister, Anna, and it's that, in a sense, that causes her suicide. Um, so, I think the, the Leonardo Colonello um, stands, but Roberto, it seems to me, to belong more to the traditional melodrama. Um, I mean, Leonardo, again, is a kind of co complex figure as a performer. Um, now, I can't remember. I've forgotten the name of the actor. I'm so sorry. I know it perfectly well. Just after giving a lecture, sometimes one can blank. Um, but um, he was a theatre actor, and uh, the scene, which I didn't show you because we were running out of time, is one of the most beautiful sequences uh, when he's completely down and out uh, and goes into the foyer of the cinema, and there's a 360-degree pan as Leonardo goes around looking at all the pictures of Gabi and the song is on the soundtrack. And um, um, it's slightly overdone, it's slightly caricatured, but there's a way in which his cigarette, he's still got his cigarette hanging out of the corner of his mouth, but it's an amazing way in which when he first appears, the cigarette is a sign of his kind of energy and his power and um, his masculinity, as it were, but at the end, it's a sign of his down and outness, that he's now just a tramp who's just come out of prison for having embezzled all of his money and spent it on his, on his wife. So I think, uh, I, I think that transition uh, in the character of Leonardo is something very particular to this film, which I think is, is wonderful. But again, you know, the performance might seem a bit kitsch nowadays. I wasn't looking at the performance merely just that he seems less to do by these characters. Yeah. Uh, I mean, he's not Charles Boyer by any means, what, by, uh, or Vittorio De Sica by any means whatsoever. Hello, I was so fascinated by how many of the things you spoke about can be <coughs> directly applied to Libeli, uh, in particular yeah. the point about the, the woman as commodity and mm -hmm. an object of exchange, and uh, but also relating to what you said about drama, melodrama, and um, music. About, about what? Um, yeah, of uh, its interest in drama and, and melodrama, melodrama, and also the yes. use of Melo's music. Yeah. Um, because, of course, the Schlitzler play there is a uh, critiquing of the sweet girl, the Susie May yes. phenomenon of the um, yeah. upper class you know, yeah. uh, yeah. men being able, allowed to have affairs with the um, lower class woman and then gets away scot free if, um, if she falls pregnant or anything happens to her. But also interesting how the um, <coughs> in Liebelei, um Schnitzler moves away from the strict naturalism and, and uh, the very strict social critiquing in, in the Schnitzler mm. play. And in the film, he opens up the, the possibility, even though it's ultimately impossible because they're constrained by, mm. by their conditions, but the possibility of a lasting <coughs> union between um, Fritz and Crystal, which is to do with Fritz's masculinity and mm. there's all the anecdotes about Offult's, how Offult's cast the actor because he had such a softly spoken voice yeah. even though he was northern yeah. German so he didn't yeah. expect him to be so softly yeah. spoken and unclassed him mm. but I think um, I wanted to draw your attention to um, that, that shift if you like towards love which in the Schnitzler play at the moment where Fritz comes to visit Crystal to tell her that he's going to take leave for mm. a while, they won't mm. be seeing each other for a while, mm. and he notices in her room a painting, mm. and she says, oh, it's a girl, she's looking out of the window, and it's winter. Mm. How awful, it's, I mean, yeah, he may or may not, but taking that motif of the winter and then translates it to the, sna to the sleigh ride where yeah. they have that moment of, yeah. of a loving union, which is, of course, the scene that is then repeated as you've also mentioned in the other films, right at the end of the film, after Fritz is killed yeah. in the duel. So I thought there's like a wonderful convergence yeah. in early offworlds of all the things that you've explored uh, in La Signora di Tutti. Yes, I think they come back almost more in, I mean, they come back in La Signora di Tutti. I mean, Liebelei is such a 
is such a strange case because um, it seems to me, although Offals took those motifs that you're describing, um, he also that because the time was so different from Schnitzler's time, um, he changes them, <coughs> to my mind, politically. Uh, I mean, there's always the question of Offals's ambivalent relationship to love, because in some ways, um, 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 in some ways, I think he see, has an almost feminist sense of love being destructive to women. Um, I mean, the women who die of love um, in, well, in Lettre for Unknown Woman and Madame Du and uh, Christine a bit there. But I, I mean, again, this is a slightly different discussion because it seems to me that making Liebelei in uh, the early 30s in Germany, he was more interested in trying to make a message of pacifism than a message about trans-class relationships. So Christine or, is, is turned more into a, a, prom, a, rather than just being a caricature of the Suisse Madel's um, sentimentality and her romantic belief in her, uh, in her love, I think it's more the importance of Fritz's softness uh, next to the man the uh, and, and, and the fact that Offals changes the gentleman, Schnitzler's gentleman, into a military, aristocratic military man, he's kind of saying that military industrial complex, as we put it nowadays, that was dominant in the uh, end of the, uh, in the Habsburg period, is coming back now. And so I think the anti dual pacifism scenes. Uh, changed the story round uh, a bit. And Offals is actually kind of indicating something of the coming threat of, uh, of Nazism. Does that make any sense? Mm. Yeah. Because the changes that he made were so radical. Then, of course, he does it again with Letter of an Unknown Woman and again with Madame Du. Interesting, and it's again the casting of Gustav Krim. In? The casting of Gustav Krim is as, as the yes. Ground, and of course, he's the, the, the head of the, the, the criminals ring M. Oh, uh, so yes, uh, of course, yes. Islam, That's true. But he's yeah. amazing. I mean, he, he actually manages, I mean, if we're talking about slightly caricatured performances, um, what's he called? Gustav Rungens. Yeah. Yes. He, he kind of epitomizes, I mean, you, if you put him next to the colonello, in La Signora di Tutti, you see a complete continuity there of the military, the obsessive patriarchal military man. I, I would like to ask a question. Laura, um, I was really impressed with the, the recurrence of uh, the music as um, uh, um, uh, the characters looking for the motivation of the music within the diegesis and not finding, mm. uh, looking behind the fireplace. Yes, to, yes. Yeah, um, and uh, obviously in those days they were doing all sorts of experiments with uh, sound being yes. a big novelty in the yes. cinema. That's Fritz Lang, yeah. as uh, she yes. was saying, it was doing all sorts of things in M and so mm. on. But in this film it seems that the the extra diegetic music is focused uh, on as if it was a maddening thing, something that you should get rid of, yeah. um, something that drives you mad. And unless the music is motivated within, within the story, uh, it doesn't make sense and should, should be simply abolished. That's the, the, because it's so terrible. Even when the two guys at the beginning of the film are talking over the sound of the, the record, you just say, can you please stop that music? It's something that is so intrusive yeah. and, and uh, so superfluous, so to say. It doesn't have any point to be there. Even when they go back and put the record again, there, you just say, no, no, please stop that. So I just want to, if, 
Am I reading too well, much? Well, I, I, I don't know. I, I think you're so. I mean, I, I never thought of that about the the fireplace and the haunted music and the haunting. But I mean, uh, I mean, one of the things about La Signora di Tutti is that it is so well Libelli as well. I mean, the experiments with sound uh, are extraordinary, um, and and using a mixture between because uh, as Libelli starts in the opera. So there's a lot of play with with music and sound, and then there's the telephone again, um, uh, and and so on. But I but to think of that scene as a rejection of extra diegetic music is something I've never heard of. I think that's very witty. It might well be that that where is this music coming from? It's just a haunting. Uh, uh, um, of course, Hitchcock has done a lot of that mm. in Vertigo. Where is that music? And then they discover that you know, it's playing there in that scene with James Stewart uh, trying to go <coughs> up the step ladder. And oh, yeah. Yeah. He also finds yeah. the, the, the. The music image. Yeah, the source, the source of the music, music that we yeah. had thought it was extra diegetic. Yes. And yes. in the end, we find the source. Yeah. So, <laughs> right. Yeah. Yes. No, I think that's a wonderful idea. That's mm. never occurred to me before. Mm. But I mean, I mean, there's so much in a way um, that's unknown, and I don't know whether Victor is working on this or not. But I mean, if someone could do some proper research into a or Fultz's experience in the theatre for all those years um, when he worked, you know, about four or five different German uh, uh, theatres. It would be very interesting to think about his, his rela the relationship between mise-en-scene, sound, music, and so on. And a lot of his, it seems to me that it must be the case that a lot of his uh, uh, cinema although transformed for the camera, must also have its roots aesthetically in some ways in his experience with him. Same with Douglas Sirk, I suppose. You know, they both had very um, parallel careers in a way. But I'd love to, to um, know more about those 19, the, his, because he must have worked in the theater from the kind of early 20s right through to 1932. Um, you mentioned camera movement as a uh, Germanic style. Um, I found it, find the camera movement fascinating because um, you were describing how it goes through walls, creating the artificiality of the space, um, whereas other directors are using camera movement to, to create a kind of reality of space. Um, um, can you talk a bit more about your feelings about why he's moving the camera? so much, what, what Ovis is trying to achieve in it. Um, I'm also quite interested in, you were just talking about his theatrical background. Mm. Um, I'm, I kind of find it very interesting when you have a, a theatre director movie yeah. in the cinema who <laughs> wants to break space. Um, I mean, to tell the truth, I don't know that we can really be able to understand um, about his use of camera until we know more about his theatre. Um, he does have some beautiful camera in Libeli, but it's really in La Signora di Tutti that it kind of explodes, and he puts it down. Uh, he mentions the cinematographer, Udubaldo Arato, who I mentioned earlier, uh, as someone who had such extraordinary courage to move the camera. But, I mean, there are moments, for instance, like when Gabi is just walking down the corridor while her father is shouting, and stops and caresses the dog and then picks up the tray again. Um, there's something very kind of cinematic about the, the way that he can take the time to pause uh, and, and just allow the cinematic image to evolve. Um, but I don't know if this is really relevant to what you're saying, but I mean, it seems to me that in many ways, one of the reasons why I love La Signora di Tutti so much is because it seems to me that it does make us think about how Offals both saw the cinema as an art and as a work of, of extraordinary beauty, which he invested in the camera and the magic of the camera, but at the same time understood that it had to be commerce and it had to come out of commodity culture. 
something that he found, I think, quite difficult to reconcile. And, um, but also, when he finally got to Hollywood and finally did have the best technicians and the best technology in the world, although he had such fights with the appalling editors who were always trying to shave off his shots and shave down the beginning and the end and break them up with cutaways, um, he found the, uh, the, the actual mechanism of the cinema in Hollywood the best that he'd ever encountered. Though actually his cinema in um, Madame Dieu and Lola Montez at the end of his life in Paris is really amazing as well. But can, this will just give me uh, uh, the chance to read the famous um, James Mason. Uh, <laughs> you know this. John, don't she? Indeed. Um, after Offal's made several films, two films with James Mason, let um, Reckless Moment and Court. Uh, and by this time, Offal's was known for his his style. And at the rap party for one of the movies, Court, I think probably, um, James Mason had written this little kind of. Um, um, you wouldn't call it a poem. What do you call it? Ditty. Uh, Ditty. Ditty. Good. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so he said, "I think I know the reason why producers tend to make him cry. Inevitably, they demand some stationary setups, and a shot that does not call for tracks is agony for dear old, poor old Max, who, separated from his dolly, is wrapped in deepest melancholy." Once, when they took away his crane, I thought he'd never smile again. Very <laughs> good. <laughs> Perhaps this is the perfect note for us to wrap up now and give you some respite, Laura. Wonderful lecture. We Thank couldn't you. Give you